Hello and welcome back to the Prehistoric Aquarium for part three of our little look at life in the Permian. But before we begin, I want to quickly show you something that I missed last time. If you're unfamiliar with how this game works, I've been doing it in creative mode. That means that I have unlimited blocks, I can fly, and I don't need to eat. Just makes the whole thing a lot smoother. However, it's meant that I've actually missed a couple of really interesting details in how the mode has been coded. For example, last time I said that most chops would have used its head sort of like a ram. Well, if we switch over to survival mode and give them a tap and wait, look at that. The amount of effort this mod has gone through to not only recreate these ecosystems, but show how these animals would have interacted um, is just really cool. And I, yeah, I'm going to have to find a better way to showcase this kind of attention to detail at some point. So over the last two weeks, I have been telling you this very lovely story about how lobe-finned fishes left the ocean to venture onto dry land and evolve into the first amphibians, animals that could temporarily live on land but still had to return to the water to reproduce. But it wasn't long before they themselves split again into two branches of amniotes, the sauropsids and the synapsids. We've now pretty much arrived at the end of the Permian for our final group of synapsids. This particular group is exceptionally important because they are the survivors. This group, the Dicynodons, actually may have lived in burrows, so I'm going to attempt to replicate that for their tank, I think. Okay, this took a little longer than I thought it would, but I like it. I think it worked pretty well. You can kind of see them wandering around. I love it. So, as you can see, they've effectively traded in their teeth for a beak. Uh, like, imagine the beak of a turtle. It's made of keratin and could be used to break roots and tough stems that they came across exploring their dens. And yeah, they look fantastic. I love the broad range of sizes and colors depicted here. Lots of different species on show. And yeah, like I said, it was probably this lifestyle that I guess allowed them to be the perfect survivors for the impending mass extinction. And in doing so, set the stage for the very last synapsid that I want to talk about today. This is a small synapsid called Cynosuchus, which belonged to a group of animals called Cynodonts. You and I owe a lot to the Cynodonts, as it was this lineage of synapsids that survived the end of the Permian. They lived through the great dying and went on to evolve into the first ever mammals. So yeah, I'm going to try and I guess highlight that in their enclosure, sort of charred earth, I suppose. Cynodonts, they have very similar teeth to modern mammals, these big incisors that gave them a very broad diet, and their small size meant they didn't really need a lot of energy, so all of these adaptations make them the perfect generalist, which generally helps you survive mass extinctions. So like I said in the last episode, try and forget this phrase, mammal like reptiles, and instead try and think of the Permian synapsids like Dimetrodon and Gorgonops as stem mammals. They're sort of on their way to the living mammal crown. Looking at them in this way helps us understand much more clearly that Dimetrodon is more closely related to living mammals like us than it is to say Permian amphibians and sauropsids and their descendants. So that's the synapsids out of the way. What about the sauropsids? Well, as you may have guessed, the other branch of amniotes are the early Permian ancestors of the archosaurs, a group of animals that include modern reptiles and birds. In other words, these are the ancestors of the dinosaurs. But what were the reptilian ancestors like? Well, let's rewind right back to the start of the Permian again and go through it once more, this time focusing on the sauropsids. And I've already made a little start on their enclosures. So just like last time, four-legged vertebrates have committed to dry land and then almost immediately plop right back in the sea again. So this is Mesosaurus, and like the Prionosuchus that we showed in part one, they've convergently evolved a very streamlined body, paddle-like limbs, making them ideal for swimming around. They're very cute, and they've been recreated so well here. So this is some footage from the Lapworth Museum, which is the museum that's basically right under my office at the University of Birmingham, and we actually have a little fossil of Mesosaurus right here on display. They've been labelled here as aquatic, and in the prehistoric aquarium, they will very happily swim around, but there's quite a lot of debate over whether or not Mesosaurus was fully or partially aquatic. A paper from a few years ago argued that the juveniles may have lived exclusively in water, but when these animals matured, they would occasionally venture onto land as well. Anatomically, they appear to be partially aquatic, but one of the main arguments for this is that we have loads of fossils of mesosaur juveniles, but hardly any adults. Because we know that fossils in general are more likely to form underwater compared to on land, the fossil record is biased, it would make sense that the land-dwelling adults are underrepresented in our fossil records and in our museum collections. So with that in mind, I think we should maybe provide them some land. And sure enough, this one's super into it. 
Next up, we have Scutosaurus, and oh my god, it looks so amazing. So this is a herbivorous para-reptile that lived in the deserts of the late Permian. I've tried to capture that in its enclosure here as well. Remember, we're in the middle of a supercontinent in the Permian, right in the middle of Pangaea. You're as far away from the sea as you could get at almost any other point in Earth history. This creates very dry and very arid environments, and we think the Scutosaurus may have actually thrived in those environments. Now, the biggest threat to Scutosaurus would have actually been our Therasmid friends, the Gorgonopsids, that we showed last week, but to protect themselves, they were very heavily armoured. In fact, there's a paper that came out last year that performed the very first body mass estimate for Scutosaurus. This is where you use computer modelling to calculate the weight and density of an animal's soft tissue based on their preserved skeleton. The model they use for it is pretty over the top to be completely honest, it is very detailed. And they found out that Scutosaurus was literally as dense as concrete. I don't mean it was an idiot, I mean it might have been, but this thing is by all definitions of the word, a absolute unit. We also have Lubidosaurus, another early reptile. It belongs to a group called the Capdrinids, and it's got this great little hooked snout. They've recreated it so well. I remember seeing a fossil of this once and thinking that it looked like that Muppet. I think it's called Gonzo. Unlike Scutosaurus, this animal was probably more of an omnivore. It has a more generalized set of teeth. And the group that it belongs to, the Capdrinids, had all sorts of adaptations that we can find in modern reptiles today. For example, some members of this group could even detach their tails when threatened as a distraction. How amazing is that? Which brings us very neatly to our final sauropsid for today, Claudiosaurus, a proper early reptile from the Triassic. Yes, at last, we have reached the Mesozoic, and I cannot wait for the Triassic update coming soon. It was animals like Claudiosaurus, again another small, semi-aquatic little creature that survived the end Permian mass extinction and went on into the Mesozoic. And Boy, is this group destined for greatness, because before long, it will produce the squamates, the group that contains lizards and snakes, and of course the archosaurs, the group that contains modern crocodiles and turtles and birds, and therefore also the dinosaurs as well. So to wrap up, we've got this wonderful new addition to the prehistoric aquarium that lets us follow the simultaneous rise of synapsids and seropsids, the animals that gave rise to most modern tetrapods that we know today, including ourselves. It's really crazy to think just how successful the synapsids were. If it wasn't for the great dying, I don't think there would have been this big role reversal and the sauropsids would have sort of taken over. By the end of the Permian, the sauropsids become dinosaurs and ichthyosaurs and pterosaurs, so obviously in one way or another they were better suited to the new environmental conditions that follow the great dying than the synapsids. Perhaps the very different way seropsids breathe made them better equipped to handle the new atmosphere. We know that living reptiles are much better suited to areas with lower oxygen, such as at higher altitudes. But I guess synapsids kind of get the last laugh. Like, they emerge from the end Cretaceous mass extinction and go on to be very successful again, eventually. And yeah, I think that about wraps us up. I really hope that this helped you to understand terrestrial life in the Permian a little bit more. I know I learned a lot myself in making these videos. But one last thing before we go, someone called Salamurda, Raiden of Brutality, which, okay, fair enough, has asked for our Agirocassis to be named Pudding, which is just wonderful. Thank you very much, Salamurda. Remember, if you want to name anything in the aquarium or if you have any design suggestions or anything, please do leave a comment below and let me know. Okay, thank you so much for watching this week's episode. Your enthusiasm for this series makes me so, so happy. I, it's unbelievable. I really hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time. Goodbye.